Coming to you live from your local blockbuster, it's the Hand Plus Podcast, brought to you by Movie Change Up. As always, I'm your host, Joe Fricky, with my co-host, Tristan Mayer, and each week, if you don't know, we break down this week in streaming, whether it's uh, your favorite movies and shows from HBO Max, Amazon Prime, Netflix, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, Hulu, uh, Peacock, uh, whatever is streaming that week. Obviously, we kind of focus on, because of our name, Hand, H-A-N-D, we focus on uh, the big four, HBO Max, Amazon Prime, Netflix, and Disney+. Plus. Uh, but we kind of, Tristan and I, just kind of watch what interests us, what we think may interest people, and kind of recommend shows things we shows and movies, things we think you should watch, shows you, and movies you should avoid. Uh, this week, we're, we're preparing a big roasting session. I'm not going to uh, go too deep into what it is. Uh, maybe if you followed streaming this week. Uh, you may have an idea of what it is. There was something that right before it released, there was a lot of hype, a lot of attention on it, and then it came out, and all that hype and attention died real quick, at least on my end. Uh, can't wait to get to it. But uh, Tristan, how was streaming for you this week? Yeah, I know last week we talked about how it was kind of a lighter week, especially for you, but I thought this week they gave us a lot. I don't know if it was a lot of quality, but it was a lot... Uh... <laughs> Uh, there was some good stuff here, bad stuff there, so it's going to be a lot to talk about this week, so that'll be a lot of fun, I think. I don't know about you, but I watched a, a good amount this week, so it'll be a lot to talk about. And some hidden gems, and then, like you said, one that I, at least I know you have some pretty hot, hotly negative opinions on, so it'll be fun to talk about that one when we get to it. When we get to it. All right, and uh, let's kick this thing off talking about HBO Max. We had a sad loss in the entertainment world. Uh, Kevin Conroy, the longtime voice of Batman, he's been voicing Batman for... 31 years, everything from Batman the Animated Series to a lot of the animated movies, Justice League Unlimited, the Arkham video games, uh, and I think because of that, Tristan, you wanted to shout out Batman the Animated Series on HBO Max. Yeah, I know we were planning on doing Kronos as a movie of the week this week, but with the death of Kevin Conroy, we decided to change it up a bit, and I decided to throw in the Batman Animated Series. I watched Mask of Phantasm as well, so I just tried to hit some of the highlights. I also watched Kevin Conroy's appearance on uh, one of the Scooby-Doo episodes as Batman, so I went one kind of Caught all the highs of Kevin Conroy's Batman on HBO Max, but of course, yeah, the, the animated series is the high for Kevin Conroy's Batman, and arguably the high for Batman as a character. You know, if you haven't seen it and you think it's going to be like a kid show or very kid oriented, you've seen like the Justice League animation shows and the Sp Superman shows, and you think, oh, it's just going to be like that. But this is not that. It's not. I'm not going to tell you that it's as mature as what we've known today. It's comic book, the comic book genre to be, but it's way more mature than you might think it is, and deals with a lot of complex social issues and topics like that. We're going to talk about Andor and how Andor has some social commentary going on. And this show has social commentary in a bunch of, ep a bunch of episodes. And Kevin Conroy, I think, really appreciated that part of the character. I know he connected to that part of the character a lot and kind of like living in the shadows kind of a thing. And yeah, he was he was Batman for so many people. And if you haven't seen the animated series on there, check, definitely check it out. There's some highs and some lows, but the highs are definitely worth checking out. If you, if you want to watch one episode, I'd definitely check out the episode I Am the Night. Uh, it's a following Batman kind of on the anniversary of his parents' death, and he starts to question, do I really want to do this? Am I really doing good as Batman, or am I doing more harm than good? Should I put this up and give it up and kind of move on with my life and put Batman behind me? And I think Kevin Conroy gives a great performance in that, a really emotionally emotionally complex performance, especially for an animated show. You don't really see that much diving into a character's psyche, but this show definitely likes to dive into the psyche once in a while, and that's one of the best ones. So watch that. Watch any of the great episodes. Joe, what are some highlights of you for the show? I know you watched it when you were a kid. So. Uh, yeah, I definitely grew up watching the show. I have uh, a couple box sets of the show uh, behind me on my uh, DVD case. Uh, two shows I'd highly recommend is Heart of Ice, which is a Mr. Freeze episode. And it basically, before then, before that episode came out in the comics, there wasn't really a definitive Mr. Freeze origin or really any kind of backstory for Mr. Freeze. He was kind of just a guy who shoots ice out of a gun and... That was kind of the beginning and end of his story, and it really gave him a great tragic story. And anytime anyone's like, oh, they should make a Mr. Freeze movie, basically what they want is a live-action adaptation of the Heart of Ice episode of Batman the Animated Series. Uh, and if you're an older uh, person, person who grew up watching the 1966 uh, Adam West uh, Batman series, the episode I would definitely recommend is The Grey Ghost, which is where Batman, uh, well, Bruce Wayne meets the actor... Uh, from the show that kind of inspired Batman to become Batman. It was kind of like his big inspiration as a kid and his favorite show growing up and about a kind of Batman-like figure 
kind of Dick, kind of like a Batman meets Dick Tracy kind of figure who solved crimes and stuff. And his character was the Grey Ghost, and the uh, character in the animated series was voiced by Adam West. So I thought it was a nice callback, nice throwback to a, a previous Batman. So like I said, if you're a fan of the '66 series, definitely check out the uh, episode titled "The Grey Ghost." I think if you're a fan of the recent Batman movie with uh, Robert Pattinson, they definitely took a lot of the aesthetic notes from the animated series. So if you like the more detective kind of take on it, and you like the way that it treated Gotham, the way it kind of looked and felt, I felt like they really took the animated series and brought that to life in a lot of ways. So if you like the way that that felt and the, the tone of that new take on Batman, I definitely think you'd like the, the animated series. So especially if you're younger and you weren't around when that was on a mere kids and you get a chance to watch it, definitely go back and check it out. It, Lives up, and I think it's a lot better than a lot of the superhero stuff we've gotten today. Even the bigger budget, like high high end act, live action shows, I don't think hold a candle to some of the stuff on this series. Yeah, definitely. All right, anything else you got to say about uh, Kevin Conroy or Batman the animated series? No, I mean he'll be Batman forever. You know, yeah. <laughs> Batman forever. <laughs> um, and with that, moves on to our other HBO Max topic, and that is The Big Brunch. It is a reality cooking competition series on HBO Max. It's hosted uh, by Dan Levy, or Dan Levy, who is the son of legendary Canadian comedic actor Eugene Levy. Uh, he's also co-creator and star of Schitt's Creek, which is a show that I don't remember where it originally started, but I know it's kind of bounced around multiple streaming services. Uh, very popular show. I think it's done well in the Emmys. But this uh, the show he's a part of now, uh, like I said, it's called The Big Brunch. And I, only, the, I think the first three episodes are out. I only watched the first episode, and I really liked it. If you're a fan of the Great British, Great British Baking Show, it gave strong vibes of that. But instead of just baking, it seems like they're making brunch food. It's a similar kind of laid-back feel. Um, and it's, I felt, they definitely took heavy inspiration from that show. And it's more, it's like, while I like shows like Cutthroat Kitchen or Chopped, uh, this show was a lot more of like the chefs helping each other. Like there was the thing of where they had to bring their three, uh, plates to the judges. You saw a lot of the competitors helping each other take their plates to the judges instead of like balance and juggling them and trying not to drop their plates. You saw a lot of them helping each other, which is something that ha you see some in uh, the Great British Baking Show. So like I said, if you like the Great British Baking Show or Great British Bake Off or whatever it's called, uh, definitely check out The Big Brunch on HBO Max. Or if you're just like a laid back fun cooking show, check out The Big Brunch on HBO Max. I do like cooking, Joe. I love my food. Is there a lot of good food porn in there? Oh, lots of good food porn, especially in the one thing I think I like. It, like, I was, I'm not, like, a big, massive fan of the Great British Baking Show. Like, I've seen episodes here and there. My girlfriend was into it. Uh, roommates I used to live with were into it. So I never really, like, actively searched for it myself. I was just in the room when it was on. The one thing I like about this show, and I, I only saw the first episode. In the first episode, it was more just, like, make the brunch thing. The first theme was, like, Make something inspired by where you're from, like the thing that you always love to make. And then the cha the second challenge that episode was make the, if you were to open your own brunch restaurant, what would be your like marquee item? What would be like your big thing? So I don't know how it's going to go in future episodes, but at least in this episode, there was more diversity and type of food. It wasn't like everyone's making scones this episode and it's just all 12 different types of scones where after the tenth person shows their skill and you're like i get it you have a variety of them. Now, granted further on throughout the season and maybe everyone's making a blt or everyone's making waffles but at least the first episode there's more diversity of food i like that uh definitely one that i'll probably throw on in the background you know maybe get myself in the mood to stare at some nice food and for a little while you know i could i could be into that yeah definitely a great uh background show and that i believe uh i don't think there's anything else to talk about with hbo max uh i could be wrong let me check my notes real quick nope that ends hbo max and with that i believe we are moving to amazon prime uh where they have just added the 2022 jake gyllenhaal starring michael bay directed ambulance and tristan i know you watch that what are your thoughts on ambulance Look, I, you know, I mean, Michael Bay kind of digging himself out of a rut, you know, and people don't necessarily love the, the Bayisms, the Transformers, that he kind of took that franchise and ran it 
into his territory. People weren't really into the way he took it, but this is Bay unhinged, and you can you can feel Michael Bay snorting coke off the lens as he's like <laughs> filming this movie. You know, yeah. like you almost wonder like at, right before they started filming, did he just like do a line off of the lens and then start filming? Because it's, it's you talking about flying around camera like the drones shots in this are all on are like really sp- there's crazy drone shots flying everywhere you know cars exploding if you don't know the premise of this uh yeah you mentioned jake gyllenhaal is a star here uh and his his brother uh Abdul, uh mateen from watchman and from Candyman. he's uh in this as well he he jake gyllenhaal approaches him and says look i'm a bank robber and i need you to come with me right now at this moment right now to rob a bank and you're gonna have enough money to live the whole rest of your life, you and your family in peace off this one bank heist. But uh, we need you right now to be our driver. So our driver bailed. We couldn't keep him on our team. Let's go. So he takes him up on the offer, and it goes very much awry. And you follow Jake Gyllenhaal on this unhinged police trace across LA in this ambulance. Uh, yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal is yelling every single line here. It's like every, every time he's given an opportunity to go to 10, he's like, okay, I'm going to go to like a 12, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the whole rest of the movie, he's like floating at a 10 the whole time. And then just pops up to the 12 once in a while. It's like through gritted teeth, he's just screaming out these lines. And yeah, I had a great time with this, you know? And I think the fact that it's just, it's not attached to an IP of Transformers. I think that takes some baggage off of it a little bit. And it, it's not super long. It's right at, a, it's like just south of two hours. So it's not like one of those long bloated Transformers movies where it's like two hours, 30 minutes. And you're like, why am I watching all of this? But yeah, it's Michael Bay given a blank check to make a crazy action high octane thriller chasing an ambulance across LA. There's exploding cars, there's all kinds of, you know, jumps, there's whizzing cameras and upside down spinning shots, and he really makes the most out of this car chase. And you're not going to be bored. Uh, if you're not a fan of Michael Bay, you might have a headache afterwards, but you're going to be deeply, deeply engaged and watching all kinds of crazy, crazy stuff happen for two hours straight. So if that's your kind of thing, you're going to have a blast with it. And it was my kind of thing, so I had a blast with it. All right. Yeah, it sounds like a movie I'd be into uh, when I'll check out if I got time. I know my girlfriend's going away next month for a couple days, so maybe in that time I'll check out Ambulance. Yeah, definitely want to check out, especially if you're getting towards the end of the year and you want to, like, rack up your 2022 list going, yep. you know, and you say, okay, what have I missed this year? Ambulance is an easy, really fun watch you know it might not be making your top five of the year but you know if, if, if this is your kind of movie maybe it will all right and also if you got a uh, amc plus along with your amazon subscription we have uh the final episode of the walking dead is airing uh this sunday i believe so if you're honestly if you have been watching the walking dead week to week tweet at us and i will let you be on this show next week because i want to interview you I want to interview you and say why. Why have you been watching this show week to week? Why, after season three, did you not realize the plot of every season is the same? Or did you realize it and you don't care? I just, I'd love to interview you, tweet at us, and I will let you be on the show for five minutes so I can interview you. Yeah, there's been multiple times that I've attempted to get back into The Walking Dead. I I made it through many, many seasons, and I I fell off, and I'm multiple seasons behind now, but... For the fun of it, I'm, I'm honestly might just tune in for this last episode. Just no context, just to see how they end it. You know, I know I know that most of the characters I followed that were on the show when I watched it are not on it anymore, including the main character is no longer on the show. So I wonder how they're going to be wrapping this up. It'll be it'll be interesting. I might give us a no context review of the Walking Dead finale next week. And that, yeah, if you if you're watching it, please do tweet at us. You can t- can you be on the whole show. I love to yeah, hear your thoughts. Honestly, you sound like a crazy enough person. I'd let you be on the whole show. <laughs> And uh, with that, that wraps up our Amazon Prime news and kicks us over to Netflix, a show I wanted to check out but haven't got to yet, uh, dropped on Netflix this week. And that is the show that is the biggest flex in entertainment history. And that is this show Netflix is doing uh, set. It's a fictional show uh, set in the world's last blockbuster starring Randall Park. Um... And Tristan, you watched it. I think you watched the whole season. Kind of what are your general thoughts on Blockbuster? Is it as good as kind of the shows that the creators of it Brooklyn Nine-Nine and I believe Superstore and some of those other shows? Is it on that level? I have seen a good amount of Superstore and I have seen a good amount of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And yeah, I did watch the whole first season of this. And I'll say it's not on that level uh, at all. <laughs> it's pretty good. 
it's entertaining, but it's not to the level of those two shows. Those are both really fun workplace comedies that I think use the workplace they're in for the comedy. You know, like the, a lot of the Brooklyn Nine-Nine comedy comes from like using the premise of being a police station in really funny ways and figuring out how to make the most of that premise. And the Superstore kind of figures out like, okay, these people who are trying to pass time with this lame job in a Superstore, like how are we going to use that to our advantage? And this is kind of like that, but it doesn't really use a blockbuster setting in any really interesting way. It's just kind of a, a, a workplace, zany, quippy comedy that happens to have the setting be a blockbuster. And I wish that they would have used that a bit more. Like there's some B plots going on of like, oh, well, you know, the local film critic died and we're going to make a wall of staff recommendations to like commemorate the local film critic that died. And that's like all they really do in terms of using the movie setting, mm -hmm. the blockbuster setting for the premise here. Uh, but it's a pretty solid comedy if you're into randall park you know he's the lead and it's very much a randall park kind of guy you know he's like the the schlubby kind of high school living in his high school days kind of manager at this blockbuster who is still kind of hanging out with his old high school friends and reminiscing about like when he got really drunk freshman year in this one party it was so cool when his ragers used to throw and you know it's kind of like this pathetic guy who's managing a blockbuster but you kind of want to root for him and root for the people around him to get this store and hold it together but yeah talking about flex joe they flexed from the first line. Like the very first scene is, is him check about to check out a customer, and he says, "Oh, I haven't seen you in a while." And he says, "Oh yeah, I've been watching Netflix." I, I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> they're like, "Yeah, we we did it." You know, a good job, Netflix. I guess you got to stomp on the grave a little bit of Blockbuster here. And there is a real last Blockbuster out there that actually is an independent business that actually is still running. So if you want to support the real last blockbuster look them up you can order stuff on their merch store order the t-shirts order their posters order yourself a blockbuster membership card a blockbuster sh uh, shell case maybe support them instead of supporting the murderers that killed blockbuster and are now trying to you know prop up the corpse to, for some entertainment but yeah it's a decent workplace comedy but not as inventive or creative with the blockbuster setting as i would have liked them to be but a solid background watch <laughs> You know, if, if, if you're into the premise, you're into the actors, you'll get something out of it, but it's not going to win you over into into this guy's collection. I wouldn't, I'd recommend Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Superstore before I'd recommend them watching this. Go check out those instead. All right, yeah, so I'll definitely uh, finish my Superstore watch through uh, before I get to uh, Blockbuster, and I would. I've, I've talked about it a little bit on here before, but still making my way through Superstore. I watch about three episodes a day, and I definitely would uh, recommend that show. I believe it's currently on Hulu is where my girlfriend and I are watching it. And there is another thing on Netflix I told you to watch today because I knew you didn't work today, and I realized it had come out, and I was wanting to watch it, didn't get to it, and I <laughs> wanted it to be reviewed on this episode. So, Tristan... You watched Falling for Christmas, the new no. Lindsay Lohan straight to Netflix Christmas movie. As someone who loves those cheesy garbage lifetime Hallmark freeform whatever Christmas movies, how was Falling for Christmas? <laughs> this was exactly those Christmas movies, almost like scene for scene what you're going to expect. So you know you get you know where you're getting when you click on this kind of movie. You know, it's not gonna all of a sudden trick you. It's not going to all of a sudden be a horror movie halfway through. You know, you're not going to all of a sudden have Oscar-winning performances. What you're all going to get is Lindsay Lohan playing this spoiled, rich heiress who has never worked a job in her life, doesn't even know how to change sheets on her bed, type of spoiled, spoiled level of spoiled. And wow, so they, she, they're just coming up with whole new plots for these movies. <laughs> uh, uh, her, she's she's uh, an heiress. She's going to inherit this elaborate... Uh, ski resort like a super sized ski resort huge huge ski resort and uh her 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 father's gonna offer her this job this really rich co cozy job at the ski resort but the problem is she doesn't want that cozy cool job at the ski resort joe what, what she really wants what she really wants to be joe is a social media influencer oh that's wow dream. that's that's <laughs> wild i never would have expected something like that from a chris like a made for tv christmas movie Thankfully, she has a uh, hot, famous internet boyfriend named Ted, who's uh, British, wow. and he's very, you know, he's he's got all his followers, and he's very much, you know, that kind of, you know. Can I, can I make a prediction here? Oh. I know this sounds wild. This sounds crazy. Is there, like, a down-to-earth, chill, normal, average, everyday guy that works at this ski resort? Let me tell you, he doesn't work at the ski resort, Joe. Oh. But Chad Overstreet does play a really cool, down-to-earth owner of a nearby ski resort. Oh wow, that's even better! It's this small mom and pop ski resort. You know, they're they're 
trying to keep the spirit of Christmas alive, you know, but they're trying, they're, they're losing against these big giant corporate ski resorts, you know, like, like Sierra's father owns and Chad Overstreet, he goes to Sierra's father at the beginning and says, look, we're not going to make it through this season. We need you guys to sponsor us. We feel like our small scale ski resorts are actually really important because they're going to get people to fall in love with skiing and then go to your big scale, massive resorts. And he says, look, I understand, but I'm not going to give you any of my money. Sorry. You're on your own kid. And lo and behold, Chad, he thinks it must be over for me, but uh, Sierra and her boyfriend are on the top of this mountain. Her boyfriend's going to propose and Sierra falls off the mountain and uh, hits her head and oh. she's found by Chad Overstreet who takes her in to his resort and tries to nurse her back to health. But the problem is that Lindsay Lohan has completely forgotten her life before the accident. She doesn't know she's a rich heiress. She doesn't know she is part of this big corporate ski resort. She just knows Chad Overstreet is super hot and he cares about his family so much. He cares about a ski resort so much, maybe they're going to fall in love. Joe, we'll see what happens. Uh, sounds like something, I mean, that's exactly what you're getting out of this. It's a, it's a Lifetime movie without the Lifetime. It's on Netflix, but it's essentially what you're getting out of the Hallmark Channel movies here. It's very cheesy, very goofy. You know, when she's falling off of the mountain, it's completely ridiculous looking. Not even trying to be sold as real. Uh, the boyfriend, Tad, is just this completely ridiculous character who's superficial beyond belief and there's actual christmas magic with no real explanation type of movie and that's what you're getting out of this type of movie that's that's joe i feel like if you like these types of movies you're gonna like this but if you don't you can laugh at it this is gonna show you exactly why you don't like these movies <laughs> it might be a fun watch to get yourself a little bit of a cup of eggnog spike a little bit extra tonight and remind yourself why you don't sit there and watch hallmark channel every year all right, yeah, uh, big fan of these type of movies. Uh, they actually released, I believe it was Jingle Bell Rock, if I'm not mistaken, a single on Spotify uh, from the soundtrack of this movie, and also because of the whole connection to Mean Girls. And uh, I was playing that song on Spotify. No, that's not what happened. Someone on the television, my girlfriend was in the kitchen away from the TV, someone on the TV who just has a voice that sounds similar to Lindsay Lohan came on and started talking and my girlfriend ran into the living room and started yelling at me because she thought I was watching this movie without her. So I will be watching this movie before uh, Christmas season. Won't be surprised if I let her know that it's available if I don't end up watching it this weekend. Uh, I need your review, Joe. Give me a follow-up. We need to review this twice, I think. So I've yeah, reviewed it once. we got to get Joe's follow-up, I think. It's another time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, also, uh, upcoming on Netflix, we have 1899, the new sci-fi series from the creator of dark definitely if you're a big sci-fi uh fan check that out coming up and i will say one thing that disappointed me about falling for christmas oh, is sorry. that Lindsay lohan spends the whole movie talking about her mother who died when she was young and how he, she bought her this snow globe and they have these memories together and i thought oh i guarantee you i guarantee you the end of this movie is a flashback to her mother buying the snow globe and it's jamie lee curtis and they're gonna have this whole meta cameo at the end teasing a sequel and they did not do that. So, you know what? You could have gotten me for Falling for Christmas too. If all you put was a post credit scene of Jamie Lee Curtis, I would have been there for Falling for Christmas. You know, Freaky for Christmas. Oh, falling and then Christmas the sequel, again. they both fall off the mountain. But instead of... This movie's cheesy and wild and no one cares about realism anyway. They fall and bump heads and they swap, like, memories. I love it. Yeah, that would have been, that would have been wild. I would have been down for it. So like yeah. I said, upcoming on All Netflix. All-time classic, I think, Falling for Christmas. What? You're going to be a Christmas staple, I think, every year. I think, Do you think it's going to be like the pr Princess Switch where uh, they made like five of those things with Vanessa Hudgens that they're going to do Falling for Christmas 2, 3, 4, where every, every Christmas she loses her memory? I I would like it. I, I mean, I'd be there for it. I've watched the Christmas Princess. I watched the Christmas Switch. You know, I'm, I'm here for those. There's oh. even a little meta joke. If you're a fan of those types of movies, there's a reference directly to one of those movies in here. So look, for, look out for the shared universe of Christmas movies. All right. And, uh, yeah, with that, like I said, 1899 new sci-fi series coming up on uh, Netflix. And uh, I'm trying to figure We're moving to Disney+. Plus. I'm trying to figure out what I want to talk about. Um, I've let you talk I, I a little. I think I know where we should start. Where, where do you want to you. start? Where do you want to start? <laughs> there was a short. There was a short. I think a lot of feelings um, about it. But it might be a lot of you talking. 
Yeah, so there was a short uh, on Netflix uh, focused on Grogu, and I'll say this, about two weeks ago, I, I, there's a subreddit on Netflix called Star Wars Leaks, and uh, I go there, you know, about once a day, check out, keep up on rumors, keep up on leaks, and there was a rumor about two weeks ago that uh, Disney Plus, or no, there's, there's a week rumor about two weeks ago that there may be a Grogu short dropping uh d- November 12th on Disney Plus, and I, you know, I was like, okay, maybe it'll happen, maybe it doesn't. Grogu character, I understand its place in pop culture, but not a character that I'm, like, crazy about or anything. So if it drops, that's cool. If it doesn't, I'm not going to be upset about it. And then, I believe, trying to think, it would have been probably around Wednesday or Thursday last week. Uh, Probably, yeah, probably around Thursday or last week. Uh, Studio Ghibli just tweeted out a little thing, little gif of the Lucasfilm logo illuminating, and everyone was like, oh, Lucasfilm and uh, Studio Ghibli teaming up, and immediately I remembered that rumor about the Grogu short, and what I thought this short could be, because I felt like it ties with kind of the darkness of the Studio Ghibli films, because a lot of them have a lot of darkness, a lot of crazy visuals, my prediction, if you had asked me what, if you had told me, yes, this is the Grogu short, is this is going to be like a 12-minute short that shows how Grogu survived Order 66. And I thought that would have been perfect for Studio Ghibli. It wouldn't have been anything necessarily too long, but like 12 minutes of actual content, not counting logos and credits, I thought would have been perfect. And then the next day, Studio Ghibli tweets out a little picture of it's a little Yoda statue or Grogu statue, whatever. It's that species with... uh, Miyazaki, kind of like the big brain behind Studio Ghibli, very blurry in the background. And I was like, okay, that's them saying we're doing a Grogu short. And I was amped up because I thought this could be cool. This could be, like, interesting. I'm down for it. And then the short dropped, and I see at the bottom corner it's four minutes long. And I'm like, four minutes? The fuck are they going to do in four minutes? And I watch it. And it's called Zen hyphen Grogu and the Dust Bunnies. And they're the Dust Bunnies that you see in all the Studio Ghibli movies. They're these little circles with fucking spider legs and googly eyes. And it's nothing. It's literally nothing. It's just Grogu bouncing around on a matte, flat background that looks like old school, like paper almost. There's no actual background. Grogu is essentially a stencil. There's no, like, artistic skill to it at all except for the person who, because it's a hand-drawn short, has the ability to draw circles and a Grogu outline. And there's, like, nothing to it. If they got Ludwig Gornson, who does the score for The Mandalorian, did the score for the Creed movies, did the score for both Black Panther movies. You know, I understand why they got him because of his ties to The Mandalorian, but they brought him in to score this for four minutes. If this, honestly, if this was one of those, like, things that was, like, an hour long of, like, you put it in the background to, like, while you're washing dishes or doing homework or whatever and just kind of a thing to look up at every once in a while, I'd get it. But there's no story. There's no real artistic skill to it, to be honest. Not, they drew everything they drew well, but they didn't really draw anything. A flower for five seconds as part of it, but... The question I got left after I was done watching watching it was why? There's no reason for this to exist. And it's not like I need, oh, it didn't like fill in any canon I needed to know. I don't really care about that. I've rewatched numerous episodes of Divisions and none of those are canon. Like, there was just zero reason for this to exist. If they released this and said, hey, this is the first of many projects Lucasfilm and Studio Ghibli are going to do together from movies to television shows to shorts and then in turn lucasfilm and disney are going to help finance original movies by studio ghibli i'd get it like i wouldn't hate this short because i feel like this is more of like an announcement of their partnership rather than just like the content but right now as far as i'm aware as far as they've announced this is the content and i don't get i don't get it like i think if you have a massive like big franchise studio like lucasfilm slash disney and a big kind of well-respected animated studio like studio ghibli and they come together on a project and it's this like how can you be how can you walk away feeling anything less than disappointed i just 
don't understand the purpose in this at all. Yeah, I think disappointment is probably the biggest part of it because I thought this as a short was not terrible. Like the animation I thought was really cute and I really liked kind of the sound design and the really the score I thought was interesting. It didn't sound anything like, you know, the Mandalorian score had a really kind of unique feel to it. And if this was an episode within Vision Season 2, I would have probably thought that it was a pretty solid episode, you know. But I think as this one single individual thing released especially because it's studio ghibli and studio ghibli comes with like this level of prestige that people look for and i just wish it was a little bit more to it and i i think that it is the announcement of the beginning of their partnership i think sure it's not a, 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 they didn't come out with a list or anything like that but i think that this is not hopefully a one-time thing i think this is them testing their waters to see how it looks with them working together with other studios and uh pixar is releasing wally this week with uh, criterion so i think we're starting to see disney reaching out to other studios figuring out ways to work together we're seeing disney plus expanding out to having more content than just the typical pg pg 13 maybe kind of stuff so this might be the beginning of something interesting and i think that's where some of my positivity comes from is i think that this might be a sign of the future of maybe disney reaching out to some other studios giving it some space on disney plus maybe this is more for studio jubilee this is just one short of many they're going to work on and i hope i hope that's true because as of right now this is just kind of disappointing that they got studio ghibli and miyazaki in the room with disney and they had a conversation between miyazaki and you know the presidents of disney and the presidents of lucas feel like that conversation happened and this is what came out of it i just mm -hmm. i wish that more came out of that conversation than just a grogu short and i hope that more came out of that conversation and then just this one thing because it was fine but for the the kind of like surprise drop of it and the kind of hype on Twitter of it, I don't understand why all that happened for this, you know? Because they, they hyped it up on Twitter like it was going to be something exciting and something special, and then it was not really exciting and not really all that special. It was just kind of a filler thing. Yeah, and my thing, I don't even care about the hype because I don't think they really hyped it up much. Like, I don't remember. Like, there was just, like, the Lucasfilm logo and then, like, the image. And it's not like they marketed it for, like, two days before it came out. I don't think they really marketed it for, like, weeks or months or anything like that. But I think more it's just, like, the partnership of these two brands and, like, that's what they come up with is just, like, why? And like you said, oh, maybe this is the first of many shorts. But if all their shorts are like this, I don't care to see any of them. It's just, like, I watched it, and I'm like, well, there's four minutes of my life I'm not getting back. Like, I just... Like, it wasn't poorly made, but I just got nothing out of it, I guess. Yeah, I I agree with you there. Definitely got nothing out of it. And I was hoping for something along the lines of what you were mentioning. Some kind of short story told within the Ghibli style, you know, especially when we're getting back into Mandalorian after a huge gap of time. This could have been their moment to get the crowd back talking about Grogu again, you know, get the crowd back hyped to see Grogu again. Mm -hmm. Instead, no one's really talking about this at all, you know. People, people really short shared that gif and were really hyped for it when they posted it and then i've, I've seen no one post about the actual short yeah yeah because what there's nothing to say except for yeah i guess that's a thing that happened but i don't want to waste too much time talking about uh this random short that i don't care about i mean i talk like i care about it i guess so maybe <laughs> in the sense i care but i don't uh but there was a documentary that you watched on disney plus uh called fire of love something i knew nothing about uh, all i know is that there is a documentary called fire of love so what is it this uh was something i actually do care quite a lot about i, I didn't know much about it either but it was a co-production between national geographic and neon the film studio and it was for a while neon's push for the best documentary contender at the oscars i don't think i think that push kind of fell through in the end but it follows the careers of these French volcanists who, uh, I mean, volcanologists, I believe is how you pronounce it. They study volcanoes is what they do. Uh, Katia and Maurice uh, Kraft, who are uh, these uh, Frenchmen, who this, this married French couple who go and study volcanoes right at the surface. And this entire documentary is archival footage and narration showing this couple and some really, really just incredibly jaw-dropping footage of them at the edges of volcanoes as they're erupting and like huge batches of lava and all shot on like this handheld camera kind of uh kind of tone to it it was gorgeous honestly this is like one of the better movies i've seen this year not just as a documentary but just as a as a cinematic piece of art like this delivered so much in terms of jaw-dropping gorgeous visuals and sound and 
also an emotional journey of following these volcanologists. And if you know their story, uh, you know how that kind of ultimately ends for them. Uh, but uh, you get the kind of a, the tragedy of that, and you get to kind of follow that emotional journey, and also get this this crazy, crazy footage of the natural world that we live in. So if you want to just see some really, really beautiful, beautiful visuals of our world, you know, National Geographic provides that, and and this and Disney Plus having this National Geographic uh, collaboration. Normally, it's like you know we're gonna have Chris Evans go surf, or we're gonna have like someone talk about you know, the Grand Canyon for 45 minutes. And this is like an actual full length movie with really, really high production value and really, really great stuff. But some of the, some of the best stuff I've seen on Disney plus this year, for sure. If you're looking to diversify your Disney plus subscription, this is going to give you that diversity. Really, really great stuff. And I, I definitely recommend it. All right. I love a good documentary, especially something like that. Don't sounds like something I watch. I'm surprised I didn't know it existed to be honest. So I will 100% be checking that out. And uh, if you don't have anything more to say, uh, one last thing to wrap up our Disney Plus talk and something that will probably take a minute, and that is the last three episodes of Andor have come out, and in my opinion, the best three episodes of Andor, and arguably the best three episodes of live-action Star Wars television, in my opinion. It was, uh, if you aren't caught up on Andor, you may want to skip this next conversation, uh, because if you are a Star Wars fan and... I would definitely highly recommend checking out Andor. I, I will say, Joe, you called them in the last episode. I will say they're called. I would say the latest episodes. It's, it's not the last episode. There's a couple more episodes left. Yeah, so sorry. For you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know a lot of people aren't watching this show yet. So yeah, the season's not over yet. So I'm gonna try and spend this conversation a little bit to pitch you guys in while you should be watching. So yeah, I hope you. I hope you don't spoil yourself. But if you do, I'm gonna try and convince you why you should maybe watch the show. Also, if you're a Star Wars fan and you're like, hey, I wasn't interested in Andor for whatever reason, I don't have Disney Plus right now, I'm spending my money on Netflix or Paramount Plus or HBO Max or one of these other services, uh, I believe, I'm pulling it up right now, give me just a quick second here, but they're basically going to be airing two episodes of, uh, well, they deleted the tweet, so maybe that's not true, but... They deleted that. That's interesting. Yeah, they did post today. If you didn't know that the first two episodes of Andor are going to be airing uh, across network TV, trying to hype up the show before it's coming into the finale, but looks like that might not be happening. Or yeah, I went to click the on the tweet. Changed. Yeah, I went to click on the tweet that I sent you. But according to reports uh, originally on ABC, Freeform, and FX, the episode will air once, and the premiere on ABC will be Wednesday, November 23rd at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. On FX, it will air Thursday, November 24th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And on Freeform, it will air the following day, Friday, November 25th at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, so if you have any of those and you want to check out Andor, but you don't have Disney+, Plus and you want to see, hey, how, how good is this show before I uh, buy... Disney Plus just to watch Andor. You can check out the first episode there. Hopefully, I don't know. Things may have changed. They deleted the tweet. Um, but these last three episodes um, on Disney Plus are a uh, prison arc where Cassie and Andor, through various reasons, uh, gets put into a prison in ran by the Empire. And it's very much a commentary on the prison industrial complex. Uh, people don't like the politics in Star Wars, but politics have been a part of Star Wars since... I, I was about to say episode one, but it's episode four, <laughs> I guess, in 1977. 1977. 1977, very much uh, direct comparisons to what was going on at the time with Vietnam. Um, but really well done, really well made. Tony Gilroy and his crew over there crushing it, knocking it out of the park. Um, yeah, I'm kind of with you with... I'd rather much more recommend people watch Andor than talk about it and break it down and potentially spoil it for anybody. Uh, but there, do we want to say who kind of the secondary character or secondary lead actor in this arc was? Because, I mean, yeah, it was I rumored, and as someone who follows the leaks, I knew this actor was going to be there, but I guess a lot of people were surprised that he was in these episodes. I was surprised he was in the episode, but I don't mind spoiling it because I think it has been all around enough. And, yeah, that's, that's not... I don't think that... In our conversation, I don't think we're going to spoil much because this is not a show where there's 
a lot of major spoilers yeah. in that way. You know, you're not gonna we're not gonna say something that's gonna ruin the plot for you. We're not gonna say something that's gonna spoil Cassie mm-hmm. Andor's art for you. They're, they're just kind of like general plot spoils to talk about, but I'm not going to give away huge things. There's nothing huge like Star Wars narratively to give away in the show, you know? But yeah, so Andy Serkis is, you know, who people may know from Pirates, or not Pirates, Planet of the Apes. Uh, He was Snoke in uh, Episode 7 and 8. He was Gollum in Lord of the Rings. He was in The Prestige. He was played King Kong, and he is also the chef in uh, on the boat in King Kong as well. Actor, he's been he around. He played for, Claw in Black Panther. He played uh, Claw in Black Panther as well. He was also the boss in Thirteen Going on Thirty, and uh, so an actor that's been around a, a long time, and uh, he kind of plays the shift manager uh, at for Cat and Cassian's section of the prison, and. Uh, he is kind of the one who has kind of the biggest growth and the biggest arc in this episode. Cassian is kind of slowly working his way towards being in the Rebellion. And this is a little bit Cassian becoming more and more of the leader uh, in his own way, is how he views himself in these episodes. And you kind of see him grow and grow as a leader. But it's really uh, Kino Loy, uh, which is Andy Serkis' character, kind of have the realization that maybe things outside the prison and inside the prison aren't operating exactly how he thought they would. Yeah, I love this arc. I thought it was incredible. And I love the whole prison, that they built this prison so well, like the details of the prison, like how the floors are electrical and they can shock the prisoners mm-hmm. if they're in, like out of their bunks at the wrong time. And mm-hmm. they really spent their time. At, and I think the pacing of this, arc, of this arc here helped that a lot. People have been slightly critical about the pacing of Andor as a whole, but I think this arc showed why that pacing works. I think they're cu- spending time building up this prison and the details of it, it really made you feel like you understood exactly what was happening and why and every single beat of this prison escape, you understood w- why they were doing it, you know? And I think that helped really well as it was building up and building up. And yeah, Andy Serkis, m- mostly known, I would say, for his like performance capture roles, but this is a great live action performance from him. And I, he really got a lot out of me. And yeah, I thought this was a great great arc and i was honestly got kind of teary at the end and i i was kind of really moved by the way that this played out and it's some of the best live action star wars you've gotten and if we're talking about spinoff stuff like the shows between clone wars and rebels i think andor is coming together to prove itself is certainly the best of it all for me yeah yeah it's hard for me not to rank the some of the animated shows and stuff in the animated stuff a little bit better but by the time we get to the final episode of the series, that could change, but it's hard to rank an unfinished show with shows that have had completely finished their runs, uh, especially ones that had longer seasons and more time to get to know the characters. But as time goes on, like I said, this could eclipse it. But Andor is not the only focus of the show. Uh, Mon Mothma is also a big part of the show, and you're seeing a lot of her while Cassian is in a physical prison. Uh, Mon Mothma is more in a mental prison and a situational prison, and she's basically this arc, during this arc of Cassian trying to uh, figure out the prison system, Mon Mothma is trying to figure out how to get to her money and move her money around without the Empire knowing. And she's faced with a kind of difficult decision. This is kind of a minor spoiler, but she talks to one of her old friends uh, that's in politics as well, and he's like, I can't help you, but... I know I have a friend in the banking system and he can help you out. That friend shows up and he gives her, he makes an offer to her and uh, Mon Mothma, not a big fan of that offer, basically forced in a way to sacrifice her child and Mon Mothma, who doesn't seem to be the biggest fan of her daughter and her daughter doesn't seem to be the biggest fan of her, shuts that deal down pretty quick. And uh, with a lot of talk of children, there's another character, Luthan Rail, who is talking with a guy in that this whole conversation to end the episode had a lot to do with children, and I'm starting to think that Luthen Rail maybe had to, uh, in a way, sacrifice his own child to uh, get to where he is in the Empire. And he's kind of struggling with that decision, wondering if he made the right choice. Yeah, I really like this arc uh, as a wider scope, too, because you have Cassian's prison break, but I think the Luthen stuff and the Mon Mothma stuff does tie into all that together. I think this is asking a larger question of like what creates a radical and what are people willing to give up in order to, to make the change that they want to see, you know, and Stellan Skarsgård's Luthen has that really, really great monologue at the end about how, how much he's given up and how he essentially had to become this 
own enemy in order to take them down, and he's lost himself in that. And Mon Mothma is realizing she's going to have to give up in some way. She, she's trying to do this very much by the books, follow the rules type of way of doing things, and she's getting roadblocks at every turn, realizing that that's just not how it's going to work here. And I think uh, Andy Serkis' character has a similar arc where he's told that you have to do things a certain way. If you do things this way, it's going to work out for you. And he's following that. He's very lawful. And then he's realizing that's not the way it's going to work. And yeah, I think that this whole series as a whole is kind of asking that same question of like, what turns someone who's dissatisfied into somebody who's willing to rebel, you know? And I think that this is examining that from all kinds of angles. And I love this show so much from that. And yeah, that seems to be like a core thing of Star Wars from the very beginning. It's been about like the, down on down to earth kind of real people standing up and like fighting against this like oppressive technology technological empire so i think andor has really kind of found that core of, star, of star wars and found a totally different way to look at it that still feels like star wars without having to give you any lightsabers or give you any you know any of those traditional star wars tropes you seem to you seem to get used to yeah. Well, how do you feel about my theory uh, that I proposed, I think, after the first arc that Luthen Rail is a former Jedi that survived Order 66? Because I think yeah. if that theory is true, I think it might have been his Padawan that he kind of sacrificed or maybe turned over to the Empire as a way to preserve the larger rebellion. Yeah, I definitely think there's more to be revealed about his character, and that theory still holds ground. I think, especially after this monologue this week, he talked about how he's had to give up so much of what he believed in and fought for, and I can see that being he was once a Jedi, a firm believer in in the Jedi ways, and he had to give all that up to see what the real fight is, you know? And then also a little mini trivia question for you. Obviously the character of Val, uh, or the actress who plays Val, is also in uh, Game of Thrones. She plays the Waif. Do you know the other uh, kind of Game of Thrones connection in this last episode of Andor? I don't know. What, what do you got for me, Joe? So the kind of banker character that made that proposition to uh, Mon Mothma is played by Richard Delane, who is the brother of Stephen Delane, who played Stannis the Manus Baratheon in Game of Thrones. So There's always a Game of Thrones connection, Joe. It comes back to Stannis every time. Yeah. I didn't realize that I didn't realize Stephen Delane had a brother, but apparently he does and he was the banker that gave that proposition to Mon Mothma. Yeah, that's a nice connection. Yeah, this has been a great arc. I think it's the best arc so far. Uh, I really like the contained story of it, and I can't wait. we got two episodes left, right? Yeah. And we're, yeah. we're in a place where they could really explode it and make it into this big thing at the end and bring a lot of stuff. I, I'm i really curious how they're going to wrap it up. they got two episodes yeah. left. Is it going to leave us on a cliffhanger? Is it going to really wrap things up? Are we going to get, you know, all of a sudden Darth Vader is going to show up? Are we going to get, like, some of those larger Star Wars connections in mm -hmm. the final episodes here? I, I don't know what to expect. Yeah, same. I have a feeling we're going back to Ferrix, maybe at least in episode 11. I don't know what episode 12, but I'm wondering if some of these storylines are going to converge a little bit. Does the season end with uh, Cassian and Mon Mothma finally meeting? Uh, very curious to see how that goes. Uh, any final thoughts on Andor before uh, we move on to our, I believe, final topic, at least as far no. as content goes? All I'll say is if you've been checked out of Star Wars because of the production value or you feel like it's kind of childish or just kind of, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, this is so much different than that. And the production value alone is what's really keeping me sometimes, you know, not just the production value with the writing. It, it, everything just feels like it's on a level above what Star Wars has been doing for a really, really long time. So if you've been checked out, come on, check back in. Give it a shot. All right. And uh, so that takes us over to Paramount Plus, and I believe uh, one of the things is it are, is it coming out this week or is it already out? Smile, the movie. That drops tomorrow. All right. Have you watched it? I've seen it. It's a great horror movie. I don't remember the late actress's name now off the top of my head, but because I know they, I, were, I know during Major League Baseball playoffs they were doing a lot of promotions for it because they were having they were paying basically actors, not actors from the movie, just like random people to be like right behind home plate or to stand like kind of near home plate behind the net and just stand there and freakishly smile and the camera would pan in on their face and it was creepy as fuck and I can't imagine just being some person <laughs> that paid $50,000 for a seat behind home plate at game six of the World Series and have to sit next to a person standing like this for two hours. That would creep me <laughs> the hell out. And I would yes, be like, I the... need my money back. But... 
The, the movie yeah. definitely creeped me the hell out. Uh, the a lead actress had never seen her or anything before. Her name was uh, Soshi Bacon. She played Rose in this Jesse T. Usher from The Boys, who played Adrian on The Boys, plays uh, her husband, I believe, her fiance, like her long term romantic partner. And she's a nurse at a hospital. Or no, she's actually a psychiatrist at a hospital. She's been working really, really long hours, you know, kind of losing sleep and losing focus on things. And one of her patients comes in and says, I've been seeing this smile following me around. It sounds crazy, but like everywhere I go, I just see somebody smiling at me and it's like very off-putting and I can't explain it. And and then in the middle of the conversation, the patient kind of loses her mind, pulls out a piece of glass from a shattered, uh, shattered base and kills herself. And now Rose is convinced that the smile is following her. So you're following Rose in kind of her psychic decline as the smile is getting closer and closer, but you're also following her trying to figure out the mystery of what is this smile and can I possibly outsmart it and defeat it? And what are, what are the rules of, of the smile exactly? So if you like the ring, it's very similar to the ring. If you like drag me to hell, it's very similar to drag me to hell. It feels like early 2000s a movie coming out with like a 2022 big studio budget. Uh, definitely recommend it. If you were uh, caught up on that viral marketing, it's just as creepy as viral marketing, maybe even creepier. I was really impressed by it. Uh, can't wait to see if they didn't make a sequel, because I know it's been making a lot more money than they thought it was going to be making. Uh, so <laughs> we'll see the this mile too. And it was actually originally going to be released exclusively on Paramount Plus, but it tested so well, they put it out in theaters. So now it's going to be on Paramount Plus, where it was originally planned to be after making a whole bunch of money it otherwise wouldn't have made. So maybe we should put movies out in theaters for a little while you know mm -hmm. surprise hits come along every once in a while we got smile we get everything and we're all at once you get terrified too you know there can be hits and i think smile is, a, is proof that even though it's a streaming show and i love streaming that you know theaters are theaters can be a really fun experience to make a movie come out and be a hit that nobody would have talked about otherwise that now it's going to drop on paramount plus people are ready to watch it and ready to talk about it so yeah check out smile really really great horror movie i know it's slightly late for horror season but never too late for a good horror movie all right and uh with that we move on to our final content topic and that is tulsa king uh showed that dropped uh yesterday it's a sunday it's going to be weekly every sunday on paramount plus show written by uh taylor sheridan created by taylor sheridan who uh if you don't know uh, wrote sicario wrote and directed wind river wrote hell or high water uh creator of <laughs> Uh, 1883, the other show that 1883 is a prequel of that I am blanking on right Yellowstone. now. Yellowstone. Yellowstone, creator of Yellowstone, and I also believe there's a new one, another spinoff, I believe it's like 1923 or something like that, starring Harrison Ford and Helen Mirren. How he, how Taylor Sheridan got those two to be like, hey, come star in my old-timey western show, I'll never know, but <laughs> I mean, he's been crushing it, I believe, you know, in the movie and uh, television space, and this is his new one. It's a mobster-focused show starring Sylvester Stallone, first uh, regular TV series role for Stallone in his career. And the premise is Stallone, after finishing as a New York City uh, Italian mobster, and after finishing a 25-year stint in prison, uh, he goes back to his old mob crew, uh, thinking everything's going to be the same, that he's going to be kind of given his old spot. And they're basically like, hey, and he, so what we're going to do is we're going to move you to Tulsa. Wide open, nothing going on over there. You can do whatever you want. Just give us $5,000 a week. And he is not happy about it. He is mad about it, but he doesn't really have a choice. And uh, the first, first episode, I thought it would be kind of slower than what it is. I thought probably, okay, based on the trailer, I was like, okay, probably the first episode is him getting kicked out. The second episode is going to be him moving to Tulsa, and the third episode maybe is when he starts to build his empire. But they're like, Taylor Sheridan's like, I ain't got time for all that. Basically, by the end of the episode, he's kind of already made a number of connections, and he's kind of starting to build his own thing. And uh, it's definitely a fun show. It reminds me more of the humor that you would see in Hell or High Water. It's not like this straight drama like Wind River or Sicario was. Uh, there's definitely moments of suspension of disbelief. You kind of got to not worry like oh why aren't they calling the cops like this isn't new york where the cops are on the take like he hasn't even talked to the cops yet like there's no reason why they wouldn't just call the cops on him but it's a fun show i think it's 
you know, if you're a big Stallone fan, I definitely think it's worth checking out. If you like Taylor Sheridan's work, I definitely think it's worth checking out. Um, it's not the most serious show ever, uh, but it's fun. I'm going to keep watching it. I doubt I'll probably, if I talk about it again on here, it'll probably be just to do a season wrap up. I really don't see the need to do a week to week. This is what's going on on Tulsa King. Uh, but I think it's worth checking out if that premise and the people behind it uh, interest you at all. How is Stallone? Is he giving an actual performance or is he giving like a phone it in a straight DVD performance? Uh, he's doing well, I would say. Um, so uh, before we started, I'm like, I'm messaging you. I was like, I got my MVP. I got my MVP locked in. This is what my MVP is going to be. And this is kind of transitioning to our next conversation. I was My MVP that I was talking about was going to be Stallone. Because I, I was like, he's fun in this show. There's actually a moment in this show that if you've seen the movie, I haven't seen the movie Cry Macho, but I've heard about it. And there's the one scene in the show or in the movie Cry Macho that everybody talks about. And I thought this scene towards the end of the episode was going to be like that. And then they flip it on its head. And I'm like, okay, they didn't do that. The show has a little bit of self-awareness. Um, and uh, I thought that was great. And uh, I don't want to spoil it here. I can tell Tristan about it after we finish recording. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, watch the episode of Tulsa King on Paramount+. <laughs> Plus. And uh, yeah, I thought Stallone was good in it. I feel like what this guy does, what his character does, Dwight, Dwight Man Freddy, yeah, that's his character's name, Dwight Man Freddy, um, does are so like despicable, but he's still the lead and you're still rooting for him that I think it had to, you had to have someone like Stallone playing that role because otherwise you would be like, this guy sucks and you'd be actively rooting against him. I think if it was an unknown in this role or someone who wasn't like super popular or super beloved, I don't think it would work. I think it had to be someone like Stallone. You probably could have, but it, and it also had to be like a muscly guy. So it, I, like I'm watching this and I'm like, I feel like this was strictly written for Stallone because I can't imagine anyone else being able to do this. And I'm not be saying like Stallone's such an amazing actor, but I think it's the baggage that Stallone comes with allows it to work. I like that. I like that take. Yeah. You know? I, I like your pitch for Stallone as the MVP because he does. I think I haven't seen the show well, yet, but it sounds like he's really the root of that show. You know? Yeah. But he, he's the reason that it's even happening, right? Is that your pitch for MVP? No, that was my pitch for MVP. And then I realized something else has come out. So do, are we moving over to our MVP conversation? I'm ready to move on if you already move on. I want to hear your pitch, Joe. My I MVP was, I pitch? Was, I thought you were going with Stallone. My MVP pick is uh, the person who gave an amazing speech and was coached to an amazing speech. And my pick for MVP is Andy Serkis as Kino Loy in Andor. I think that's definitely where I was going as well. I think Andy Serkis really summed up uh, that arc so well you know and i think what makes a rebel is inspiring rebellion in other people you know not just in yourself but i think the fact that this show had the smarts to not have cassian give that speech to not have that be his hero moment and being like oh here take the mic cassian give a hype speech it's going to be it's your show right you're the main character give the speech i think that was a good a good choice for that i think we got to give a runner-up not just down skarsgård though he came in, he gave that monologue, and he walked out, you know? That's how you do it. You show up for one one scene, and you kill it, and that's your scene for the week. Yeah. So I feel like I got to give a second place to Stellan Skarsgård. Yeah. Stallone, if Andor didn't exist, you would be my vote. And you may crush it. The season finale of this show may be incredible, and I'm like, we have to give it Stallone for Tulsa King. But if I'm being fair and being respectful, I think... I think Andy Serkis was just better, and I have to give it to Andy Serkis, as much as it pains me. It's it's the whole Oscar race all over again, where everyone thought, oh, Stallone has it locked up, and then and then some random man swipes it out from under him. But So we're giving it to Andy Serkis for carrying the game, or are we giving it to Stalin Skarsgård for coming in for the big play at the end? You know, I, how are I think we got to give it to Andy Serkis, you know. Stallone had that, or er, Stalin Skarsgård had the three-pointer at the end to win him the game, but... Andy Circus led the team in points, so we got we got to give it to Circus. Yeah, I go with Andy Circus, especially because we said the conversation he's known as the motion capture guy, and he got to give a really cool live action performance and be the forefront of the episode. Yeah. So I'm all for it. 
All right, so that locks our locks us up. The MVP of the week of November 14th is Andy Serkis as Kino Loy and Andor on Disney+. Plus. And uh, anything else you want to say about uh, this week in streaming before we end the show, Tristan? No, a packed week, and we have all kinds of more stuff coming in the next couple of weeks. So, you know, even in the rest of November, we still got Wednesday coming up. We still got a kind of, all kinds of stuff coming in the next couple of weeks. So it's going to be a crowded, crowded couple of weeks here. All right, and next week we got our movie of the week, and we're going to watch Malcolm X. I believe it's the 30th anniversary as well. We got Angela Bassett, uh, recently crushed it, and Black Panther 2. She's in the movie as well, so kind of a connection there. So if you want to join us on our uh, movie of the week conversation next week, Batman the Animated Series kind of took that spot because of the passing of Kevin Conroy. Uh, watch Malcolm X this week, or if you've watched it before, uh, and you just feel like rewatching it, check it out so you can join in on the conversation. And if you have any recommendations for us, things you want us to watch, things you want us to cover more, things you're like, hey, you talk about that show or that movie too much, shut up about it. Stop uh, tweet, talking about Star Wars, guys. Yeah, stop talking about Star Wars and Marvel. Tweet at us, at Movie Change Up, the kind of network home for this show, and uh, talk to the hand. And uh, without further ado, goodbye. Hey. Thank you for watching the Movie Change Up podcast. We'd really appreciate if you liked, commented, subscribed, and shared us with anyone you think might be into what we're doing over here. Thank you. Have a nice day.